Welcome, and thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. We want you to fully engage with us, so feel free to gather your family, invite a friend, or if you're alone, we trust that you'll have a wonderful worship experience with us today. Our worship service will begin in just a few minutes. Have your way now, Father. In our hearts, Father, we surrender all our thoughts, Father, all our insecurities, all our fears. To worship your name, Father, because you are worthy. We lay our burdens down at the foot of the cross today, Father. We raise up our hands, Father, our voices, our praises to you because you are worthy father for all of it have your way now father holy spirit 
knit us all together, Father, as one, as we worship you. All of creation singing the song of oldest days.
ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the sun. Rejoice, 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 Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Oh, come thou day spring. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night. And that dark shadows. Awesome. Let's rejoice in the Lord.
the joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy, 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 joy. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. He is my hope. Oh, joy, joy, oh, joy. We cry, no oh, 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 Everywhere is Christmas Everything is shining bright Oh, what a glorious night is Christmas
Father, we thank you for the authority of your word. We thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ, for the joy of the Lord is really our strength. So, Spirit of God, please come and help me to help your people during this glorious time of the year that somehow in some way can turn bad. It can turn frustrated. It can turn fearful. But Lord, I pray that you would help me to help your people understand at the end of the day, no matter what season it is, it is always all good because of you, Jesus. So Spirit of God, please come and help me help your people as always in Jesus' name. Amen. So early in my walk with Christ, um, I used to be awakened in the middle of the night and or in the early morning darkness and I used to have this sense of fear. Uh, like someone was watching me or looking over me or wanting to be with me in this space, in this, in this room. And to a point that I would like flick on the light to make sure, you know, I was, I was there by myself. But it, the, in, the interesting thing about this was that I came to understand that there was really nothing to fear. It was just God uniquely intruding my space and time just to be with me. But maybe like some of you, when, when you have that alone experience or that spontaneous experience with God, many times it can become very fearful or frightening uh, to us knowing that a holy God wants to become intimate with us and potentially expose things that are in our hearts that need to be uncovered and exposed. And truth be told, same thing occurs today. He can wake me up in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning. He wants my undivided attention. I'm in a separate room, family room, you know, our, our game room or wherever in my house. And now here I am weeping like a little baby boy because God is, is speaking to me, um, engaging with me, dealing with me in unique and special ways. Uh, in other words, this same sacred fear overwhelms me today in the presence of a holy God. So the question is, do you ever uh, have these type of experiences or when God shows up in some unique way like this? So you walk in on a Sunday morning, whoever's up here preaching begins to preach about everything you talked about the night before. <laughs> you know, it's like, wait a minute, who, who told them what? You know what we were just talking. Did you talk to the pastor? Did you talk to? Did, did you let him know what was really going on in our lives? No. But what it is is a present encounter with God, the glory of God, that He wants to be intimately acquainted with you and to uh, expose things in our lives. But ultimately, that we can be come at a place that we know that at the end of the day, no matter what season, what he's trying to say to me, no matter what he's trying to adhere to, wants me to adhere to in my life, it's, it's all good. It's all good. It's nothing to be frightened or afraid about. So in this though, the, the truth in it all is that when God does interrupt and intrude our space and time, we can become frightened and frightened, uh, being frightened causes the flight experience or the flight reaction. We're afraid God is dealing with us. He's exposing. <laughs> Exit. Stage right. I can't tell you how many times I've seen as a pastor over the years people drawing closer and closer and closer to Christ. But then it's almost like right when they're about to receive that breakthrough I don't see them anymore. It's like, it's like when God starts to Mix up in your Kool-Aid, we used to call it when I was new in my faith. You know, begin to read your mail. They used to always say, it's like God's starting to read your mail. It's like, who, how does he know what's really sealed in my life? Many times it, it becomes frightening and fearful that it's like, oh, this is getting too deep. It's getting too intimate. It's getting too specific. Let me, let me run away. Let me flee. Run away hide that's many times the experiences that we have that are real when we are going through seasons in our lives that God is wanting and longing to visit us and in true yes our space and time ultimately 
so we can know that, you know what, Cedric, you know what, folks, it's still good with him, and he's still doing a good work in you. There's nothing to be afraid of. So if you could turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14, what we're going to do here is reflect and learn from some average shepherds who was in the field minding their own business, doing what they normally do, tend to the flock, and bam! God just suddenly impacts them with his presence. And the goal is to be able to reflect upon how did they respond and how should we respond when God intrudes our space and time while we're minding our own business. So just like them, when he does intrude our space and time, it can become frightening and we have several options. But my hope is that we will choose the best option that is to stay put and let God deal with us so that we become the people that he ultimately wants us to be. And here's the last thing I want to bring out before we dig into this passage, is that just as then it is today, he uses the same approach. You know what he does? He sends Jesus. <laughs> he is not going to change the approach because we are a new generation, you know, new group of people, new set of circumstances. He's going to send Christ to ultimately intrude your space and time, rock your world. But it's always important to know that no matter how frightful and fearful it gets or you may get, it's still good. Amen? Luke chapter 2, beginning of verse 1, it says, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was first, uh, the first census taken while Cornarius, a just, uh, Cornarius was governor of Syria. And all the people were on the way to register for the census, each to his own city. Now Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was out of the house of the family of David. Verse 5, it's in order to register along with Mary, who was betrothed to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him with cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I-N-N, not E-N-D, right? In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock at night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terribly frightened. And so the angel said to them, don't be afraid, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of great, of the heavenly armies of angels praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among people with whom he is pleased. So let's answer this first question. Why do we fear the Lord's presence? And I believe it can be found in two derivatives of the word fear. The first is found in verse number nine. It says, an angel or messenger of the Lord suddenly stood near them. And it says, the glory of the Lord shone all around them and they were terribly frightened. So what frightened here means this, they were seized with alarm they were terribly startled by strange sights. They were stuck with amazement. So here's the reality when God intrudes our space and time through Jesus Christ or through his messengers is that it will initially cause an alarm. Like, okay, wake up, something's going on. Okay, is it time to panic? Or is it time to be happy? Is it time to be sad? Is it time to, to run? Or is it time to hide? Then you have this other transition of being startled by strange sights. It's like, wait a minute, this never happened to me before. This is different. This is weird. 
This is funny feeling. Man, it's touching my emotions. When they sing, God's glory comes and it's like, why am I crying? Why am I feeling this way? Why do I, hmm, I, I've never experienced anything like this. It is strange when someone tells you about yourself and you don't even know them. It is a strange sight to see transformation in your own life and you look in the mirror and say, I can't believe it, I'm not the same person I used to be. Is something really wrong with me? You see, we begin to be struck with amazement and there is this choice that we have to make. Do I run and hide or do I stay there and let them continue to do the work? Do I trust that it's all good when he arrives? You see, this other definition is this, is, is found in verse 10. Do not be afraid. So remember, we're struck with alarm, or seized with alarm, we're, we're startled and struck by certain sights and amazements. We have this choice to make. And, and it's interesting that the angels says this to them. Don't be afraid, which means don't flee. It's strange to you. You never seen this happen before. It's clear that the glory of God and the presence of God is intruding my space and time. Don't flee. Don't flee. When he starts to deal in areas in your life that no one else knows but him. Don't flee. Don't flee when you're, you're having personal private problems and before you know it, somebody else knows about it and starts to speak into your life not because someone else told them about it but because God knows everything about you don't flee this word afraid also means do not be scared away and again I like to reemphasize so many times I've seen in my walk with Christ and my servitude to the church that someone will navigate life and God is doing amazing transformational work in their lives but it's like that one thing there are two things that he says, oh, by the way, I need to intrude that. I need to go there. And we're like, no, don't go there, God. And sometimes we're scared away. So it looks like this. God is dealing, doing some amazing things in my life. I'm not the same person. You know, I don't have the same angers and frustrations. I have such peace in my life, right? Things are going well, things are going well. Then God says, oh, by the way, you know what you got to do? You got to forgive everybody that hurt you in the past. no. That's scary. That's an amazing sight. That's alarming to me. And then you'll see people who, in their joy and exuberance, before that, they were coming to church every Sunday. Matter of fact, they were early. Begin to see every other Sunday, once a month, once a year. It's like, whatever happened to them? Well, they were scared away from the glory of God because the glory of God his light will shine on our darkness he will shine on our defects on our insecurities our pains everything that we tried to cover up all of our lives everything that we were taught to cover up as men as women are strong. you gotta be strong because you know he may disappoint you so you gotta be strong Right, he's going to disappoint you way so you, you be strong and independent and then God says no that's not how I wired you that's not how I made you let your guards down oh but that's scary no you don't understand God you don't understand right so scares me away scares me away makes sense so our challenge is to understand that in the presence of God, when God shows up radically in our lives, we can be frightened by this unusualness that begins to hurt, happen in our lives that will cause us to either flee, be scared away because it is quite, quite strange and amazing what God is doing in a person's life. Makes sense. So, we have a choice. We will be so frightened that of his sudden appearance 
because he is, becomes near to us, right? Listen to what verse 9 again says. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them. So the, when he suddenly stands by you and gets close to you and he's present, will you flee? How many songs we may sing? How many prayers will you pray? God, I, I just want to get to know you. I just, well, he's got to get to know you up close. And when he becomes, pre listen, we, many times we want the presence of Jesus with the T-S, in with T-S, but he says you must first have my presence before you get the presence. Oh God, I need you to move my finances. I need you to move my finances, but you know what he says? No, I can't do it outside of your heart because wherever your treasures are, that's where your heart is. So I have to first deal with your heart so I can heal your treasures. You gotta let me close in your heart to heal all those other areas in your life. God, I want to see your glory. I want to see our family healed. I want to see my marriage healed. I want to see my children healed. I want to see you. And he appears suddenly. And our challenge is that when he appears, uh, will we let him come close enough to do the work that he desires to do in our lives. We can't be frightened by a sudden appearance. You see, in our fears, again, just to reiterate, can easily cause us to flee from the glory of God. Why is this? You see, if you look at this word glory, listen to what it, it, it says. His magnificence. He gets closer. You see how magnificent he is? It's very easy to run from that. Because magnificence, root word, magnify. He becomes big, he becomes more, he becomes all. That can become overwhelming to a point that I become afraid, afraid and I just can't handle it. Uh, this word glory also means this excellence. You see, again, remember, he'll get so close to us and intrude areas in our lives that we used to get away with at one time. But he says, no, no, my excellence says you can't get away with that anymore. Others may, but you may not. I'm calling you to a greater excellence in, in your life that maybe you used to do this, but now you can't. The closer and closer you get, you see his glory, you see his excellence. There's this greater call to excellence. And then you have preeminence. Think about this. No, wait a minute. Before you got close enough to me or I allowed him close enough, I was preeminent. In other words, I was the boss. I was the ruler and governor of my life. Or there was someone else who was the ruler and governing your life. But then you begin to realize, no, no, he isn't, she isn't, they are not. Because you begin to experience the preeminence of God, which causes you and challenges you to make sudden adjustments. Over and over again, you can look at this word glory and realize that, wow, his dignity, his grace. Think about this. Once you begin to see him, get, uh, uh, experience him like you never experienced him before, and he gets closer and closer and closer, you begin to experience his marvelous grace. So, many, so much that his marvelous grace will overwhelm you to a point that you say, wait a minute, it's just too, it's too much for me to contain. And sometimes people run away from that. That what, what do you mean? You forgive me in spite of me? Everything that I did, everything that I said, that you, you canceled it out? Yes. But then this is where it gets really difficult when he intrudes this space. Oh, by the way, you know you, that same grace I gave you? <laughs> that person that you don't want to give it to, you got to also show them grace. Hold up, God. You don't get it. You don't get the pain that they gave, you know, administered in my life, the frustrations. You don't understand how disrespectful they were to me. And, and, and over again, he'll replay, no, no, no. My grace was sufficient for you, right? right? Just as I have forgiven you, you also forgive them. But that's what happens when his glory appears. 
That's what happens. And, and again, remember, our nature, our inclination is like, no, I, no, I don't want this. I don't want this, God. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It's too complicated. It's too emotional. It's too intense. So let, let me run away and flee from your presence. It scares us away easily. But we need to understand, as always, when God arrives in certain areas in your lives, suddenly, no matter how afraid you are, no matter how uncomfortable it makes you feel, it's all good. It's still all good. No matter how complicated it may feel to you, it is in its all reality. No matter how it presents itself, how much alarm it brings you, no matter how you're struck in amazement of it, it's still all good. Amen? Yes, when we genuinely encounter the Lord in all of his glory, it's going to shake us. It's going to shake the very foundation in which your life has always been built upon. Because that's what he does. But it's all good. So what does the Lord's presence and his glory brings us? So if you look again at verse number 10, verse number 10, it says, And so the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. The first thing is this, is that no matter what season in life you're in, Christ wants to bring you good news. He wants to bring you good news. Now, what is this in its totality? It's very easy to think that, and this is proper theologically, is that the good news is the coming, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, even his soon return, part of the entire good news definition. But what we cannot lose sight of is this, the good news is not only tomorrow, right, when you die and go to be with Jesus, absent from the body, present with the Lord, but you are living in the good news right now. You're living in the good news. The scripture clearly says that he has placed eternity in your heart right now. Once you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, eternity lives within you. In other words, you are walking in eternal life today, even though it's not manifested until whenever you go to be with Jesus. So what I want to remind us all in this Christmas season and really make known to us is, first of all, we need to understand that this good news should touch every single area of your life. It's not just the sweet by and by. It's not just the end of your life. It is the beginning of your new life. It is the middle of your life. In every breath you take, in every step you take from this point on, it is the good news of Jesus Christ. It is the good news. Now, what is this? Think about this. He brings you good news. Good news is this, the joyful tidings of God's kindness today. Yes, he is kind and his kindness that draws us to repentance. But his kindness is upon you today. And it's so important for followers of Jesus Christ to really slow life down, right, during this season at least, and hopefully it carries over to every season of our lives, right, is that at the end of the day, every single part of our lives, Jesus is expressing his kindness in you and through you and around you and upon you. But it gets better. He says, that is this glad tidings of the coming of the kingdom and, and is of the salvation to obtain in it through Christ but listen to what it also says of what relates to this salvation glad tidings are brought to one to instruct mankind concerning the things that pertain to Christian salvation again salvation is beyond the grave and so many followers of Jesus Christ live in mess and live in turmoil, live in frustration, live in difficulty, live in pain, waiting for salvation. No, salvation is here. It's here. It's here. 
That's why you can read Isaiah 61, verse 1 through 5 with a different lens now. Listen to what it says. It, it describes the benefits of the good news this way. The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me because the, the Lord anointed me to bring what? Good news first to whom? The humble. If I don't realize and have a correct estimate of myself, right? If I don't realize that I need him, I will always be in need. If I don't recognize that I'm lost without him, I will always be lost. If I don't come to a place in my life that I realize that, you know what? I just don't have all power. I will always be put in positions that are powerless. If I don't realize that I'm not that smart, but he is all knowing and all wise, I will always find myself in positions feeling insecure and less than and not that smart. He is all knowing, he is all powerful. He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think or imagine. He is not ourselves. So it starts with a place of humility. This good news simply says, I have to be in need. Because remember, Jesus says, I didn't, I didn't come from the, for the well. I came for the ones who are sick. Doesn't mean that you're literally physically sick, but it can mean that. But he simply says, I come for the people who understand that they need a doctor. So this good news starts there that it's a place of humility which leads then to this. It says, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to captives and freedom to prisoners. Verse 2, again in Isaiah 61, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of God. Yes, believe it or not, found in salvation, found in the good news is also God's vengeance. To comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the cloak of praise instead of a disheartened spirit. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Oaks. Oaks. So think about this in its totality. So goes and begins all with humility that I need you Jesus and I can't do anything without you Jesus I then you could say it this way I am complete because of the coming of Jesus the death the burial and the vicarious resurrection of Jesus I am now complete I am whole because of him which leads to this this good news then is for the broken hearted. Whenever you have a broken heart, he comes to heal it. Someone disappoints you, breaks your heart, he heals your heart. You, listen, when you go die and you, we die and go be with Jesus, there's no, bro, no broken hearts. So who is he reading it? Who, who is he saying this to? People who are still alive, still navigating life still working through complexities and disappointments of life. He says, no, my good news is for the brokenhearted. Listen, my good news is to release the captives and the imprisoned. So here's the marvelous imagery I want you to get when it comes to captives and imprisoned. There will always be seasons in your life that you may feel imprisoned or a stronghold may try to take hold of you. Always. It could be, okay, you, you, know, you, you lost a loved one grief tries to hold you captive what we cannot forget is this even though you may feel captive you always have the key it's the good news of Jesus no, no matter how if you're having a rough day a rough week and you feel like oh life is so miserable oh I can't believe I don't even feel like a Christian I can't believe nobody loves me and there's heartache right and there's strongholds and you can find yourself in captivity all we need to do is reach for the key and that key is who? Christ because of the finished work of Jesus Christ this good news releases the captives in prison. Yes, 
When you come to know Jesus Christ, instantaneously release. But guess what happens to some of us? There are some strongholds that still lurk around. You got the key to that. You got the key to addictions. You got the key to strongholds of pornography and anger and you got the key. You got the key. It's the good news of Jesus. Listen to what it goes on to give us is that through the good news it proclaims favor upon us. This good news provides vengeance again. Listen, Scripture says, vengeance is mine in Hebrews, saith the Lord, I will repay. Yeah, there are people that treated you unfairly. God gets that. Let him handle it. Let him handle it. Because that is the promise of the good news. The good news says that he comforts the mourner, that he gives gladness. This good news, listen, makes us oaks of righteousness. You're like a tree planted by rivers of water bearing good fruit. It's the good news. Listen, there's no need to have a comparison of a tree when you're with Jesus. But when you wait and you're frustrated and you're disappointed and you're discouraged and you're alone, you need to know that this good news says for you today that he makes you oaks of righteousness. Amen? Amen. And with this good news, Christ wants us to know that he brings great joy with it. You see, listen, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he has imparted within you fruit of the Spirit. And one of them, guess what, is joy. He brings joy with him. He brings joy with him. See, the, the words great joy means this. It means, it means gladness. But it doesn't stop there because this is super important again as we navigate life today. He is bringing also the cause and the occasion for joy. Let that, let that settle in for a minute because some of you today may be saying, well, I don't, I don't have reason to be joyful. Just lost this, just lost that. This just happened to me. So he says, okay, he gives you gladness, but guess what he will also do? He will cause joy to happen in your life. Because you know why? Sometimes we need joy to be caused in our lives. It's kind of like this. You ever meet someone and you're just down in the dumps. You're Debbie Downer. It's like, okay, you Eeyore. You know, Duke. You know, okay. Right? And they just come, hey, how you doing today? Hi. How's your day going? Hi. And you're like, get out of my face. God will set you up and bring someone in your life just to make you have joy. Or, or to, to ignite the joy that is already in you. You know, you just walk around moping. It's like, oh, I can't believe it. Life is so painful. And, oh, oh. And, and sure enough, guess what will happen? He, he'll cause a prayer that you've been waiting on for years just to poof, emerge cause joy it's like wait so and then here's our challenge our challenge is but God but you don't understand I'm mad at this <laughs> well you understand what he did to me you understand what she did to me and he's like Doug can you see what I just caused to happen in your life I personally believe there's causes of joy that is all around us and many times we miss because we're so focused on what isn't. There is reason enough to be joyful. And here's the big one, the good news. If nothing else happens around you, understand what has happened to you. That's reason enough. If we continue to focus on what isn't, right, 
versus what God has already done. Who would have joy, right? So let's go deeper. You see John chapter 15 verses 9 through 11 says this. He wants us to have lives that are full of joy. Jesus was saying this to his disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I, ha just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So think about that for a minute. Again, he's saying, no, no, you have joy. You don't have part joy. You have complete joy, full joy. Why? It's because joy lives in you. Now, what could hinder you and I from being joyful is missing out on the love of Jesus. Remember, he says, you need to know that I love you just like the Father loved me right and this will make your joy complete and full by the way doing what I commanded you to do makes you what full of joy two things love him love him enough to do what he says you'll never be without joy or you'll never be without joy fully manifesting in your life because joy is in you waiting to come out of you. But it gets better. It says when the people of Israel, think about this, when the people of Israel were in exile, they had everything to be frustrated, disappointed about. Right? They were in exile and then this guy by the name of Nehemiah says, hey, by the way, God's given me this revelation. Let's go build this wall. Build. Yep. Yeah, right? Okay, well, everybody said, okay, well, let, we, we're going to rally around you outside of uh, two guys who were pushing against the building of the wall. And in the midst of building this wall, and these people were on a timeline, being pushed immensely, missing their family, which is all dispersed, total chaos. Just imagine that with me. This is what the Lord reminds Nehemiah about and causes Nehemiah to remind, remind the people about and what my hope is to remind you about today. Listen to what he writes. Do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your refuge or your strength. So I say to you today, stop it. Don't be grieved. Rely on the joy of the Lord who's your refuge. You can hide in him right and he's also your safety place the joy of the Lord is your safety so no matter what you're going through it's almost like God is saying no 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 you can't be grieved I get it because I've experienced everything that you have yet without sin but what you need to know it is not time to be grieving right now because I've given you joy so whatever you're going through again in this season of life, no, don't be grieving. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Because he will, like he's always, he always does for each one of us, he will intrude our space and time with some good news of the great work of God that will cause you and give you an occasion of joy. And so this is, I shared this earlier, this is what happened to us. Some of you know my mother-in-law came to live with us within, you know, five months she was gone. But in the midst of those five months, great time with her to serve her and just love on her. We had an occasion for joy, a cause of joy. And it came through a grandson. He's like, what? spontaneous, intruded our space and time, but you know what it did? Caused an immense diversion. It was a gift from God that my mother-in-law was still able to, you know, love on and enjoy herself, but caused such a diversion away and gave us a cause for joy in the midst of pain. 
Did we expect it? Did we want it? Did we know it was coming? No, trust me. It was a, an occasion for a surprise. It was surely like a shock, standing all like, what? What's happening? And all like, really? Now? But immediately, instantaneously, provide a necessary diversion of joy. Trust me, God is good. And if we look around us, give them space in our lives for opportunities of joy, you will see them wherever you go. Because his promise is, he's given you great joy, he's given you gladness, and, and if you don't think you have it, he will make sure you will be caused to have it, and he would create an occasion for you and I to have great joy, amen? amen. And that's why you look at 1 Peter, last verse. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 suggests, through Christ, we now have this inexpressible joy. Inexpressible. It says, and though you have not seen him, anybody seen Jesus face to face? I, I have it. So this is written to us, especially. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but you believe in him. That's us. He says, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul joy lives inside of us if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ joy lives in you let it express itself through it through you don't suppress the joy of the Lord. It says it is inexpressible. This is the type of joy that God has given us. Inexpressible love and joy and peace and long suffering and temperance and self control. All the fruit of the Spirit He has given to us. And joy today is the primary one we're focusing on is that He has given it to you and it comes through His finished work and His impartation of His Holy Spirit who lives with each one of us. Amen. So can we do, these, uh, do this in our, in our final um, statements for today? No matter what season of life you're in, no matter, can you always remember this? Christ only brings good news. I get how we can feel. I get the realism of circumstances. But Christ always and only brings good news. And Christ ultimately wants us to have lives that are full of joy. Full of joy. And again, how do we know that? How can we be assured of that? Joy lives in you fully. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the finished work of Jesus Christ, for the good news of Jesus Christ. And in this good news, Lord, and your great expression of love towards us, you have filled us up to capacity with joy. So Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that God, no matter what circumstances, no matter what season of life, any one of us that are in today that we will know without a shadow of a doubt that the joy of the Lord is our strength and that God that you are bringing good news today your good news isn't merely for eternity beyond the grave but your good news is before the grave and God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we will be men and women, young or old, no matter what season of life and circumstances we find ourselves in, that everything that you bring us is all good. Hello, this is Pastor Cedric, and I want to thank you so much for joining us during our worship service today. And I have the privilege now of leading you through communion and are the sacraments today. Before we get into the sacraments, I'd like to just give you an opportunity to pause and reflect and remember the, the, the presence of Christ in your life and my life 
in two ways. The first is this, is that Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for your sins and my sins so that we can have a personal, intimate relationship with him and one day see him face to face. Uh, we say that it is absent from the body, but present with the Lord. But in the meantime, or in the wait of being in his presence for all eternity, we can also have a personal, intimate relationship with him here today because of this finished work. And we should remember the tragedy of it, but yet the triumph of it, that he died a horrific death for you and for me. But then he also rose again on that third day so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. The second part of the remembrance is this, is that Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. He's coming back for a bride that is without spot or blemish. In other words, it's likened to that bride who prepares for her, her bridegroom that one day that she will be intimately acquainted with her, her future husband. And in the wait, she is taking care of even the undergarments uh, that are not seen by anyone on that wedding day, but her husband. I believe that God wants us to take care of those intimate places in our lives that only he sees. So today I want to first, before we participate in the sacraments, give you an opportunity to reflect on those two areas of remembrance. Number one, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? If you don't, I'd like to lead you in a short prayer to make sure that you do. Secondly, if you do have a personal relationship with Christ, are you taking care of those intimate places in your life that only he sees. Can we start with the first? If you could just pray this prayer with me and it goes like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me that I'm a sinner and I ask you through your finished work to wash me clean. I recognize that I tried to live my life apart from you, but today, Jesus, I surrender my life to you completely and ask you to come into my heart to be my Lord and my risen Savior. I surrender my life to you Holy Spirit, come in my heart to live forever, to lead me and guide me until I see you face to face. But then the second group, our prayer is this. If there's something in your life, Christian, that is hidden before God or you need to take care of, this is a great opportunity to fix it or get it right before you participate in the sacraments in remembrance of him. Can you just bow your head right now and just reflect upon, is there something that you need to reconcile back to God? Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you because you says that, and you said in your word that there is none that are righteous, no, not one. But you also said, if we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness, O oh Lord. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. Please do that today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 reminds us of this. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a person must examine himself in doing so. He is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For the one who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not properly recognize the body. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number are asleep. But if we judge ourselves righteously, we will not be judged. Again, can we pause today to judge our own hearts before the Lord? Now today, if you have juice, uh, preferably grape juice, and bread or some form of wafer, 
you can now participate in the sacraments with me. Again, as a reminder, this juice, even though it's, it's simply something that you can have on a dinner table, lunch, uh, during lunch or breakfast, and the wafer is something you can pick up at a local store. But today, it, it's something more important because it is reminding us of his finished work and also what he is yet to do because he is coming back for his church. Amen. So can we now just prepare to participate together? Again, this wafer, this juice, reminding us of the finished work of Jesus Christ and a work to come. Let us all partake in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, and may God bless you. Thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. If you're ever in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey region, we hope to see you in person. But for now, please tune in next week here at Commitment Online.